started on Sunday, uh, I believe, and since then, Penn State's gotten two commitments. So, welcome to the BWI Live Recruiting Show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Just because it's the dead period doesn't mean there isn't news. There aren't things to talk about. There's a lot to talk about on today's show. We're recapping January. We're discussing the class of 2025. We're getting to the news of the week for Penn State football recruiting. And the guys to do that for you are here on the show. Ryan Snyder, recruiting insider for Blue White Illustrated. Sean Fitz, recruiting insider for Blue White Illustrated. Together, they are the best in the industry to know about what's going on with the Nittany Lions. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. First thoughts to get out of the gate. Fitz, Deshaun Burnett committed since the last time you and I had a conversation. We talked about him in his breaking news video, if you want to check that out. But Fitz, want to give you the floor for your thoughts on Penn State's latest commitment. Yeah, it seemed like this one moved pretty quickly. Um, based on the feedback that we've gotten, Tom Allen was a big driver behind this. Uh, you know, I thought personally when I heard uh, over the weekend that they were moving in that direction, that it would be, you know, Terry Smith, Penn State's doing amazing in, in Western Pennsylvania right now, obviously. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was one of those things that was, I, I'm not going to lie, I was so surprised by the, uh, the movement there. Uh, Burnett's an interesting athlete. He's got the size, he's got the athleticism. Um, I, I thought the junior tape was was just okay. Curious to see where he ends up, whether it be linebacker, defensive end. Ryan, I know you talked to a couple of people who thought maybe he's an offensive player. I, I don't know. I don't know. So, um, but uh, but Penn State added him yesterday, and uh, you know it's another another step in Western Pennsylvania. I see Doug uh, Doug hit the chat ready to go here. Um, talk to, <laughs> to talk about Western Pennsylvania Pitt specifically, but uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And, and I talked about this on the Alex Tash video the other day. Is that Penn State? It seems to be getting who they want to get in Western Pennsylvania. That's not always been the case. You know, Notre Dame's been there, Ohio State's been there, Michigan's been there certainly, um, and and you're going to find you know guys that slip through the cra- the cracks and everything like that. But Penn State, for the most part, has become the it program in Western Pennsylvania, and I'm I'm very surprised to say that after the last uh, decade and then before that. So um, we'll we'll see if this continues. I know there's a lot of buzz in that 2026 class out there. I know we often talk about Harrisburg and the and the guys there in 2026, but there's a lot of buzz in 2026 in Western Pennsylvania as well. And states still like to keep going or get going in Philadelphia, but uh I mean, it, there's there's places to criticize uh the staff here, but uh Western their their effort in Western Pennsylvania has has become one of the uh the whispers instead of uh, one of those loud noises. So, um is it because of Narduzzi? Is it because of the way that Pitt's done it? I it's been an interesting approach, man. Like they, they've got guys out there that they haven't offered, that they haven't prioritized. And mm-hmm. what were they three and nine or something like that this year? I, I, I don't get it, but it doesn't seem to be a situation where, uh, with your players, Western Pennsylvania players are, you know, prioritizing pit in and, and seem to be using that as a fallback. So I, I think it's a, kind of a symbiotic relationship there is is one one side's not showing the interest the other side is not showing the interest so they feel that their time is better spent elsewhere and we'll see where that uh we'll see see how that works for uh pat narduzzi and pitt uh, in the next couple of years yeah so doug w threw in the chat here for everybody listening on the podcast he says i'm not sure how to put this delicately but is pensey doing so well because of narduzzi at pitt he seems to be divisive uh and pensey uh, in this class we'll get to later a strong flavor from Western Pennsylvania in the 2025 class. Not that they have lacked that previously, but it seems at least right now at the building blocks of this class, very strong in that region. Ryan, um, we've talked a little bit about, you and I have talked about a a lot of this stuff uh, already this week, but two commitments in one week um, here in the first week of February. How is Penn State doing uh, in your opinion, as far as building this class and building it the way you think maybe they should or shouldn't, or what's your thoughts overall, just a general sense on this class? I think about what I expected as far as this period of the year. Uh, we did a story a couple of weeks ago on just how many guys do you normally get around these junior days and all that, and it really averages basically two or three guys uh, coming out of this. Now, what's interesting is what we hit on in – Burnett's uh, video yesterday is he hasn't been on campus since September. So that's always uh, interesting just because you don't see that very often, especially after a a three week stretch with junior days. And there's a lot of opportunities to visit. Uh, You know, he, he went to a bunch of other schools throughout the fall and, and, you know, ends up picking Penn state. And of course he was at Penn state a ton before then. So that that's why he already kind of knew what he had there. But, you know, as far as the class overall, very good start in Pennsylvania, uh, as Sean alluded to, you know, five five guys from Western PA, 10 guys total. And when you look at the eastern half of the state, there's there's still plenty of guys that they can add too. So they took, uh, I think it was eight last year in Pennsylvania. And 
I wouldn't be shocked if they get right around that number. I don't know if they can get to 10, but uh, you know, a lot of that will probably kind of depend on camp season and, you know, maybe another player or two emerging, but you, know, you got Michael Carroll, you got Lex Cyrus, you got a a Andrew Oles, you got, who else am I, who am I leaving Zolders. out? Bowlers, obviously. Duh. Um, you know, so there, there's plenty of guys there and uh, you know, the St. Joseph's prep guys are out there. So it'll be interesting to see where this, uh, where this goes in the spring. We are going to get to all of that, uh, especially mentioning Matt Zollers. That's coming up next. But if you're if you're watching the video here, uh, getting settled in, first couple of minutes, we're talking about uh, opening thoughts. Always a great time to like the video as well and share with your friends. Remind everybody, hey, that Penn State football never sleeps, and we're here giving you the good stuff Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So like and share with your friends. And, of course, if you haven't yet, check out bluewhiteillustrated.com. Great time to sign up because you can get two months for a dollar if you use the code PSU1, that is a special offer just for our YouTube and podcast listeners. We love you guys so much. We appreciate how much support you give us here. So we want to give you a little bit extra. That $1 deal usually is just for 30 days, you know, just for the month. But because you're um, a lifer here on the YouTube and podcast channel, you can check it out for a dollar and get an extra month. Uh, this show also supported by My Perfect Franchise. Are you ready to live the American dream? And that is to determine your own future. Andy Ludicky at MyPerfectFranchise.net can help you with all of those things. He is a franchise owner. He has learned all the things you need to know about business ownership and ownership of these franchises. And he is here to coach you through the entry process and follow up with you as your journey progresses. We were talking with him a couple of uh, weeks ago, and he was talking about how he was trying to talk somebody out of getting into a franchise. So this is a consultation service that's 100% free. He's not trying to sell you on anything. He's trying to help you succeed. So if you have experience in corporate uh, business, if you have uh, specific trade skills that you wanna turn into your own business, whether uh, the economy is booming or there's a downturn, it doesn't matter because there's always something moving. There's always an area of growth. And he's going to point you in those directions. His service is 100% free. He's here to help if you have any questions about business ownership. Check out the Blue White Illustrated message board to get in contact with him. He's there. He's um, active on message boards. Or you can email him, as you see here on uh, the, the YouTube channel, 404-973-9901 is his phone number. And Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. Phone number again, 404-973-9901. Latest news for Penn State football came out, uh, I believe it was yesterday, maybe it was the day before. Matt Zoller's that quarterback we just talked about, a national prospect at this point. Uh, he's down to his top four schools, Penn State, Missouri, Georgia, and ironically, after what we just talked about, Pitt uh, is here in his top four. Fitz, what do you make of this top four? Uh, I know that the top fours are what they are, but what do you make of this group of, of schools that Zollers has narrowed this down to? Yeah, I mean, I think that that makes sense given where he's been in the last couple of weeks. Um, he went to USF, Florida, Georgia, uh, went to Missouri a couple of days later, and then back to Penn State. Pitt is in there. His brother is a uh, is a walk-on for the Panthers. So they uh, have been present since the start, I believe, if not one of his first, uh, if not his first power four offer, one of his first power four offers. So they've been, they've had some staying power in there. Uh, Georgia, obviously the, the big one that you look at, but I honestly wouldn't sleep on Missouri either. They've been killing it in terms of the NIL game. They've been very present in, uh, you know, a lot more recruitments than you would think. I mean, we're, we kind of live in this bubble. Um, there's the SEC bubble. There's the Big Ten bubble and Missouri, of course, now in the SEC, but also in the periphery of that, that SEC bubble. So, you know, people don't really think about Missouri as a, as a threat, but he went down there, uh, liked it from what I understand. And and that's going to be a that's going to be a, a program that is to be reckoned with from an NIL landscape um, that, that that people probably wouldn't expect. So. I think all contenders uh, to, to cut it down from that. I mean, I would have expected Florida to be in a top five, but he decided to to lop them off and go with a go with a top four. So I think all contenders there. Penn State's had him on campus a bunch. They've prioritized him. They've done a lot of things right in his recruitment. But uh, he's going to take the next step. He's going to continue to, um, you know, be uh, go out and see spring visits and and things of that nature. Probably, I would think a decision by April May. Ryan, does that sound about right? Yeah, uh, I'd be surprised if if it's not done by the end of April. <laughs> he almost has to to some degree. Look at how wild the last three four weeks have been for him. It's going to be 
pretty similar in, in February. I know it's a dead period, but you know, coaches are going to still be contacting him electronically, texts over the phone, you know, Zooms, all that throughout this month. He's got basketball going on and, you know, Springford went all the way to the semifinals last year in basketball. So that'll go probably, I don't know if they're going to go that far again this year, but they should stretch it throughout most of February and, and maybe into the beginning of March. And then he's going to have to hit the ground running, probably see as many uh, of those four schools again as he can. And I'd be surprised if, uh, you know, sometime around mid April, he's not ready to get this over with, but, you know, just from talking with him over the last year or two, and then, you know, or not year or two, last couple of months, I should say. And then in recent months or recent weeks uh, after this surge of offers, like I know it's 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 weighing on him, I guess, the best way to put it. So, yeah, I'd be really surprised if he if he makes it into June. And here's a part of what's going on. I think you guys have pointed this out previously. Here are the 2025 industry ranked quarterbacks for this uh, current cycle. Bryce Underwood, Julian Lewis, these guys, if you notice, as you pointed this out, these are all commits. Antoine Hill, not committed. Uh, uh, <laughs> Hassan Longstreet, <laughs> oh, that one tripped me up quickly. Uh, but you you quickly see that we get down to Matt Zollers as one of the few quarterbacks that's left uncommitted in the top 15. So uh, it, this pressure you're, you're talking about, guys, comes from the teams that don't have a quarterback yet are all trying to get on one of the last trains of these guys that we've evaluated and decided are part of this top uh, group of quarterbacks is that a fair way to put that fits yeah i think so i mean it's it's all dominoes all the time when it comes to quarterbacks so it's not a situation where like everybody affects somebody else but like two or three guys come off the board that changes everything like if you look at um ryan montgomery right now in ohio penn state was in his top five ryan and i have always been on this you know on the other side of the fence saying he's not coming to penn state but uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. So there's some overlap there with Matt Zollers. And then you look at some other quarterbacks in Texas and then Missouri's in there. Juju Lewis in Georgia is a big, I would say big domino to fall. He's committed to USC, but he was just at Georgia over the weekend. And that's a got to be a priority. He's, he, he is from Georgia. So um, Georgia doesn't let too many of those guys get away. So when he committed to USC, it was certainly a surprise, but to, to see him pop up there on campus, not a huge, uh, not a huge shocker there. So, just a little bit of everything, just like one line moving into another and it's going to affect somebody else. And Zoller's is all of a sudden, like he's one of the hot names. He's one of the five hottest quarterbacks in the country right now, just in terms of offers, in terms of visits, in terms of like just general buzz. Um, Penn state was ahead of that, but like, there's still a lot to fight against. And that's the, I mean, that's Georgia in itself. Let's, you know, I was just going to try and single out one thing from Georgia, but there's a couple <laughs> of national championships in the last few years. Yeah. They seem to do a good job of, 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 uh, describing that program uh yeah. missouri is, and then uh, of course the the family connection at Pitt. so like there's a lot of things that that go into this decision i'm curious to see how penn state's two quarterback approach um you know it, how that has to do with his decision you can say that it doesn't matter but beckham crits of being there already in the class i mean you got to look at that and say if he wasn't in the class maybe maybe zoller is already in i right. I, I don't know that's just me speculating that's yeah. what we do here on a podcast so um, it's a, uh, it's a very interesting, um, sort of dominoes and, but Penn state has prioritized Zoller, I believe Zoller's. I believe. T Frank, let me add one thing real quick to that. Yeah. Juju Lewis too. He was 2026 and he reclassified to 2025, like three weeks ago. And it was right around the same time that Georgia offered Zoller's. I think he, I think he announced it maybe two or three days before Zoller. So I'm not sure how much that impacts him specifically. Like I, from talking to everybody who covers Georgia, like they seem to be very, very interested in Zoller's. But also make no mistake, like Lewis is without a doubt Georgia's Georgia's top guy. So I, I think that kind of circles back to Missouri, maybe as the school to, to maybe watch a little bit more because Zoller's is well aware that yeah. uh, Lewis is going to be someone that Georgia pursues until the very end. And Missouri, I think, is a good fit for him as well in terms of what mm -hmm. they do on offense. I like the way their scheme fits his skills. Of they're they're a zone heavy team. He's athletic. You can not. You don't have to kill yourself with the read option because they have a good passing game as well. So there's a lot of things I think Missouri is on the rise in those areas. So when it comes to Penn State, I guess the last question I have here about Matt Zollers and this particular recruiting is looking in the future, not asking you to predict when he commits, where he commits or any of those things, but what are the things fans should look for in terms of is it spring visits that are the next thing to set up for, Zol uh, for Zollers and um, uh, how would you read those things if the news comes out when it comes out, uh, Ryan? I would say Penn State's proximity, maybe can they sneak in two visits? 
you know, compared to you know, some of the Southern schools, right? Because they look at, look back at December, right? Uh, they snuck on, they didn't sneak them on, but you know, they got him on campus when everybody else was focused on 2024, you know, they got him and Tash who of course committed the other day. So uh, can, can they somehow maybe get him up early for a spring practice when he has a, a, a day off, pra- you know, basketball practice or something like that, and then circle back and, you know, get him back for the blue white game. I think that would be maybe a little bit of a sign on where Penn state's trending there. But uh, you know, I, I, I would be surprised if he doesn't go back to Georgia and Missouri one more time as well. And Pitt's going to be in the mix too. Again, his brother is currently part of the team. Yeah. Fitz, same question to you. I agree. Um, you, you try and again, sneak him up. If you can say that, like come up for a visit, just come up during the week or something like that, you know, to take a, get him to get, take a day off at school, get him in the room. I think the thing that I like for Penn state here, in addition to proximity is we're, we were talking about this guy like well before Penn state offered. And like when he offered Ryan and I both hit each other up and was like, Oh, they, they, they done, they went and did the thing. Like this mm-hmm. is a very different, uh, different recruitment because you, you obviously you get to the end of your junior season. Then sometimes you get these February offers and, and January junior day offers and things like that. But They liked him enough when he was not a four star, when he was not a guy that was on the national radar to uh, to to offer him. And that that goes back to Danny O'Brien. I mean, O'Brien, I think, has been the guy that's been around him the longest and he's sticking on the staff and they're trying to figure out the ways to to make him stick long term here. And uh, I think that that's another thing in terms of proximity is the fact that they've been here the entire time as a target not just as a guy they've been stringing along but uh, a guy that, that they've had as a target i mean i was talking about malik washington for the longest time and it seems like zollers has i, I don't want to say clearly moved ahead of him but pretty clearly moved ahead of him in terms of the priority there so mm-hmm. um the very interesting uh look into the thought process there for penn state but like when we were talking about guys that were targeting I, cause I remember I wrote this story back in October about the, the guys that they're targeting at quarterback and, and Zollers was one of those, even though he didn't have an offer I think that says a lot about what they've thought of him the entire time. And I think he's felt that, uh, that sort of, uh, respect that they've given him. Ryan, one last question, uh, for you, actually, no, I, I'm going to come to you about junior day a lot. So Fitz, I want to come back to you with this question. Um, Ethan Grugmeyer last year had a meteoric rise up into being a, a top 10 quarterback. Zoller's already is in that territory. I think we just saw he was 14th uh, in the industry rankings. Do you think he has the ability to move into the top 10? Do you think his skills and his uh, frame and talent and tools all are that of a guy who could be in a similar situation at the end of this recruitment? I do. I do. I think this is a guy that's really moved up and he's done it like on with the tape on the field. It hasn't been a situation where he went out and threw rate and shorts and t-shirt and, and did mm-hmm. some things like that, but he's been able to show his versatility. And this is, this is another reason I think Missouri is uh, like a, th- a legitimate threat here. I think he's a great fit for what they do. And, and Missouri, I don't think gets enough credit in terms of what they do offensively, but they've been one of the more consistent offenses in college football. And it's been kind of fun to watch, uh, fun to watch whenever they come on my TV. But uh, yeah, I think he's done it in pads. Um, he's got the size to back it up. This is not a kid that's coming in on a visit that's six, three and leaves at six, one. Like he's got, uh, he's got a lot of those things where you check that those boxes and uh, the athleticism certainly there. So you just really like the entire package. And I think when you look at him, you see a top 10 quarterback, but playing at spring forward, which is not going to get the respect that a lot of these guys are going to get playing at the the, the bigger schools, um, you know, is probably something that probably would have held him up. I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what would happen if he was in the last cycle. Like we didn't discover as a whole Ethan Grunkmeyer until the spring evaluation period. And they got out there and say, oh, this kid's pretty good. I think you can see that like on an accelerated timeline with Matt Zollers and, and you mm-hmm. can see it in the tape. And I think that that's the big thing that sets him apart is that he's done it in pads. T Frank, let me add one more thing real quick. It's sure. it's like the opposite of Grunk, right? Like Grunk, it, he he his rise was because of camps and seeing his technique and and all those little things. Where Zoller's was more so the film. So yeah. I think that that speaks well to Zoller's opportunity to move up because he's going to get a shot at you know at least a lead, lead eleven regional camp. And if he makes it to the finals, that'll that'll get him an opportunity in front of all those scouts to see you know, all those little things that, you know, Charles prioritizes, uh, you know, like we talk about arm strength and all those little things, but it's more so footwork and yeah, I'm not a quarterback guru, but yeah, just, just to chip in here. Some of the things I saw and I put in his advanced scouting is the, the throwing motion, his uh, rotational throwing, his ability to throw accurately off platform. He has a throw on there 
where he doesn't have either of his feet in the ground, like a Jordan Love style throw. Mm-hmm. That's going to do very well. You know, I think you you make the comparisons talking about the, the recruiting timeline of these two guys, but I think the talent style of Ethan Grunkmeyer and your uh, and uh, and Matt Zollers are, are, are fairly similar as well. So it'd be interesting to see how all of this progresses in the summer. Yeah, I think I think they're I totally agree. And I would say Zollers is maybe a little bit of, better of an athlete as yeah. far as his, his, you know, 40 times, stuff like that. It's been really interesting to watch them recruit quarterback because everybody is different than Drew, but everybody is like, I think, legitimate athletes. I mean, I watched yeah. Grunkmeyer run a four four one seven or something like that shuttle last year. Like the, these guys mm-hmm. are legitimately athlete, athletic, and that's uh, you know it's pretty cool to see that. I don't want to say that that sea change, but they all kind of remind you of Clifford in a way. And uh, I think that that's a, and I mean that in a compliment, I know they know the Clifford <laughs> pretty polarizing, but in terms of the things that they bring to the table, maybe you're not the biggest guy, but Zol- I mean, Zolders is a six, three guy. Um, but uh, it's, it's just an interesting, I, I, I think the floor of the quarterback room has, has steadily risen no matter who the offensive coordinator was in the last five years. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, they still bring the same level of throwing ability, like that athleticism isn't in lieu of their ability to play quarterback, at least from a, from what we've seen from them on the high school level. I forgot about that. I forgot about that shuttle time. That's a good point. I, I, sleeping on Gronk Meyer's athleticism. That was impressive. Yeah. Let's get to junior day because we've got a lot of stuff to get to and some bigger topics that are a little more broad. But some of the specifics, Ryan, you had a chance to talk to some of these players that uh, came to junior day, the final one before the dead period. Uh, general overview, how was the feedback uh, from the players you spoke with about their time at Penn State and their feelings on the program? Yeah, it's it's a lot of the same stuff, you know, from the previous two weeks. I, I would I would say that overall, you know, from the three junior days, the consistent theme is Franklin, honestly, as much or more than the, than the position coaches. And obviously they go on and do positional meetings and watch film with their with their assistant coaches. But I think James is uh attentiveness uh throughout those entire junior days and the way he communicates with not just the players but the parents the bluntness which we've seen from james often i mean that's that's one thing that really makes kind of james unique is how involved he is throughout really all of recruiting but these specific kind of visits and then also just how open he is about whether it be anything from nil to your son coming up here and having to earn everything because that that's not the case everywhere. I mean, a lot of uh, there are a lot of examples, and and I've had players talk to me about how you know coaches will just kind of tell you whatever you want to hear to get you there. Uh, that's not James. It's, it he kind of takes the exact opposite approach in some ways. Uh, so I, I think that was maybe the consistent theme throughout all three is just again how involved he is and how you know you're going to get the truth from James no matter really kind of what you ask him. And a lot of players and parents appreciate that. Uh, I think I've frozen here. <laughs> Can I you guys see hear you. me? I okay, see you. yeah, we got All you. Right. Yeah. So my to- my computer locked up, but hopefully is everyone back on the screen? Uh, Look good to me. Okay, great. Uh, so Fitz, I'm going to come to you and just want to ask you, there we go. want to ask you about some of the, the important players that came for this final junior day before the dead period, get a, a good uh, lasting impression before you can't go and visit anybody else. Were, were there players that you were monitoring on the back end? Because I know there were some names that we had going into this that were important to you. Have you gotten the feedback or the kind of the idea of how things went for a guy like maybe Zaire Addison, Jeff Exon, or Cam Smith, any of those guys? Yeah, uh, Addison's one that popped up. I know Ryan talked to him on Saturday night. Um, I think it's one that you're just going to have to – I don't know. I don't want to say hope you can get as many visits, maybe get two more visits out of him, uh, but hope you can land an official visit. That is a really good looking athlete from Florida. I mean, this is, he's, uh, you know, six, four and a half, uh, 285, but we, we saw the track things last week. Um, so there's, there's a lot to like in terms of like what he brings to the table as an offensive tackle. I, I have to keep reminding myself they have two offensive line commits in this class with, uh, with, with Olin Alassine and, yeah. uh, and, and Brady O'Hara. So like the, there is room there, obviously, but it's it just it's just a mind block that I've got where I think they've only got one offensive line commit. So we're gonna see where it continues to go with like guys like Carol, Malachi Goodwin, but uh Zaire Addison certainly um in that mix. I know Michael Gibbs was up from uh from North Carolina as well. So um you've got a couple of a couple of options there. Um it seems like Josh Williams trending to Stanford, the in-state prospect, uh, you know, is uh, is a guy that uh, Penn State offered 
out of camp uh, over the summer identified pretty early, but uh, that Stanford degree seems pretty interesting or pretty important to that family right there. So um, beyond that, you look at uh, the receivers that they had on campus this weekend. Uh, Jeff Axenor is the McDonough guy that we talked about uh, a couple of times down the show. Uh, Romero Eisen is very interesting to me. I think he's a really good player. Like he's a, a, a sprinter, but also he's got, uh, you know, decent size is over 510 um, which is funny because we've talked about the the difference in how size like pe- people are so apprehensive to take a guy that's 510 when you look around the NFL and there's a lot of 510 wide receivers yeah. in favor of a guy that's 64 you look around the NFL number one there's not a ton of 64 wide receivers and the ones that you got are special so I think wide receiver maybe shrinking a little bit in terms of expectations um and and this kid has the wheels to go with it. He's got a 10, eight in terms of a hundred, four, four, uh, 40. So like, there's a lot to like, and he can catch the football. Like he can go out and he can play and catch football. So, um, he was there. Trey Jones was there. Um, a nice little group of wide receivers on hand. Uh, Samari Reed from Florida is a guy that popped up, um, who's been on campus a couple of times now. So I look at that receiver group and everybody's going to, hand ring about receivers all all cycle long and i get it um but there's uh there's been a bunch of guys that have visited from that position over the last month uh, you know uh, I, I really go ahead go ahead i was just gonna throw in here just a, a conversation i was having about the difference between the nfl and uh college football with somebody on the message board and i think this is an area where there is a clear difference between college football and the nfl and fits it's just it's interesting that you mentioned what's in the nfl but the defensive holding rules are so different. We just got through the senior bowl and talk about a rude awakening for corners that suddenly can't grab people 10 yards down the field. So that I, I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. And those smaller guys are all over college football as well, but what goes in the NFL and what you kind of need, I think at some points in college football, where you need to have a dude who can just shove a guy off of him to get open there might be just like a little bit of a disconnect there. So a little bit. Interesting thought. I, I, I agree. I agree with that. But like, it comes down to the quickness. I think like yes. it comes down to being a six foot. If you're a six, four guy that can change direction, like a, like a six foot guy that changes the math a little bit there. And the guys that eventually filter to the NFL are those guys that can do that. Like it's not, there yes. aren't too many stiffs running around. It, it's kind of what I'm going at. And and when you get to college, you have that transition time. When you are six, three, it takes you longer to get into it. When you're six, four, it takes you longer to get into it. than a guy that's been playing at that size and that level for, you know, a couple of years now, because he stopped growing was in 10th grade or whatever. So that is what I'm looking at is, guys that can potentially make an impact. And I know we rate guys based off of NFL potential and things like that, but the way that those guys can get jump started and, and get playing early is to play at that size and be used to that size instead of taking that transition time, which you want to hit on the six, four. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Everybody For wants sure. uh, a guy that can do that, but I think the hit rate receiver is not great in terms of hit rate. And it's not just a Penn state. This is not just a Penn state problem, but you bring in four of those guys. You hope, two of those guys hit and more often than not, I think it's going to be the smaller guys. Yeah. And you make a good point. Part of the hit rate for Penn state recently. And I think the, the recency bias in my head is they've all been of a particular type and now right. like, okay, we'll then go away from that type. But it's kind of like hiring a defensive coach after an offensive coordinator, et cetera. Ryan, you look like you had a much more important point than mine. So what did you No, no, actually that was good. That, that was good. I, I was just going to mention, Sean, you mentioned a bunch of receivers, but like Jordan Houston's in, intriguing to me just because he camped twice. Now I don't have a lot of feedback yet on his junior season. And that's something I have to get a better read on, which will help us get a better idea for where he's at on the board. But the fact that he's camped twice has been here multiple times. Um, you know, he's from St. Joe, St. Thomas more, by the way, I probably should have let off with that, but, uh, you know, legit six foot one eighty, and, and Penn state knows the kind of athlete that he is. So just, he's a guy that I could see coming back to campus one or two more times. And depending on where the wide receiver board is at, like he, if he was signing with Penn state in, you know, however many months from now, it wouldn't surprise me again. I want to get a feel for his junior season film. That's so important. I haven't asked about that much, but uh, just from a camp perspective and what we've seen him do as a freshman and sophomore, like the the numbers look pretty good. You, you uh, said something there, Ryan, where you said if he ends up signing with Penn State, I wouldn't be surprised. And I feel like there's guys, especially in that 2025 crop of receivers, they all fit into that mix mm-hmm. without trying to, you know, single out like this is the top guy. I think Quincy Porter is the top guy, but is, Penn, is he going to end up Penn State? I don't know. But you look all over the region and you've got Lyric Samuel, 
You've got Zymir Smith. You've got uh, Michael Thomas in Jersey. You've got a couple of those guys in uh, at Baltimore City College that like are going to be knocked because they play at Baltimore C- City College, but they can run. They can catch the ball. Vernon Allen's a really good player too. He was just up. I didn't even mention him. Uh, mm-hmm. Romero Ison's there. They got. I think they got three D one receivers, but I think they're going to be knocked because they're at Baltimore City College. And I, I think there's a lot of very good options you mentioned. I think, did I hear you say Lex Cyrus there in the background? Yeah, Lex Cyrus too. Lex I mean, Cyrus is another guy. Desi yeah. Jones is a really good player. Like there's a lot of these guys that I look at and say, these are really good players. And it's not about like trying to find, you know, it's always about trying to find the best ones, but it's, it's, it's so hard to split the hairs between some of these guys in the region, because I think they're, they're all good. Are they, can they be great? And that's the, that's the projection that Higgins has to make. I know Mark Dupuis back and, and the offensive staff have to make. And I, I throw my hands up and say, I don't know how they're going to do it because these, these guys, uh, some of it's similar, some of it's, uh, you know, some of it's obvious. I don't know. I, I just don't know how they're going to, to single out those guys and then decide who to press on, who to step, step back from. It's, it's all going to be a very interesting do- uh, balancing act for this staff. We didn't mention Matthew Otten either from Virginia. Another guy when he got an offer, well, I forget which game that was, but I don't know, November, October. Just I just remember we were talking to to some people. They they seem pretty high on him as well. So, yeah. well, we got to catch up and with Matt and see where things are, and we'll we'll learn more obviously in the spring. But yeah, yeah it's, like, it's, it's like there's like ten guys there trying to do a mini board or big board or something like that. You could do one on Monday and do one on Friday, and you could. You know, theoretically, just be, be different. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll is maybe we'll do that next worse? week. Anybody notices? Yeah. <laughs> so there are years where there's clearly defined targets. There's clearly like guys that have separated themselves, and then there are years like this. I imagine and it goes in cycles. But is, is there one that you would prefer if you're Penn State, as far as like we have our identified targets, we're going to go hard, hard after these guys, or in this sense where it seems like, as you mentioned, the board can change, and you, maybe there's not even a clear consensus in the building on it. Which one do you think is more advantageous for finding a guy or finding guys that can come in and be those difference makers that Penn State's looking for? I'd rather have depth because if you miss on your top guys, you're in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah I guess. I I don't know. Yeah, I think you can make arguments for both because like, right. you look yeah. at that 2022 recruiting class and thought they signed a really good class. And then all of a sudden, like you're trying to figure out who's going to be able to make it to their third year. So like, it's, yeah. it, I, I don't know. So it's a, it's an inexact science. Uh, the problem with receivers being dime a dozen is that receivers are dime a dozen and that you can mm-hmm. find some really good ones. And you can also, you know, you look at that class that Justin Shorter, Daniel George and, and John Dotson, and you felt really good about getting a high level draft pick out of that. In yeah, Justin Shorter, yeah, and then yeah. Jahan Dotson's a first rounder. <laughs> so I, I mean, I'm 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 glad I don't have to make these decisions. Is there a is there a position you do feel like there's more clarity about? Because receiver is the 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 most important to Penn State fans right now. Even though these players won't make a significant impact on the team for a couple of years, but you need to restart the engine. There are there other positions now that we're out of junior day where either new players have emerged guys have separated themselves or it's just been pared down where you feel like okay we know going into spring this board has more clarity is there a position that kind of fits that fits yeah but it's tight end and nobody wants to talk about tight ends so <laughs> yeah um, i was gonna say running back they're all done <laughs> yeah running back and tight end yeah the, the positions they do really well i no, there's there's really not. Um, and you look at what's in the region at say defensive end, and there's not much defensive tackle. I think there's a couple of guys that stand out above the above the crowd there, but those guys are hard to sign. Um, linebacker, and I know we've had some questions in this in, in the chat. Linebacker is interesting because you've got a couple of guys, DJ McClary and Alex Tash on board, Deshaun Burnett, you could probably throw into that mix as well. Um, but they've had a bunch of linebackers on campus, and obviously Penn State fans like to talk about linebackers. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a situation where I think they're okay. Um, I was not crazy about the, the the linebacker class last year. I'm very curious to see which direction they're going to go in in terms of adding the next guy. Uh, Cam Smith is very interesting to me because he's he fits that Sam role. But how much are you going to see that Sam role uh, under Tom Allen? So there's there's a lot of questions that go into that. Um, seeing more of an emphasis on the box right now. Um, we're going to see what happens. Uh, I think uh, Anthony Sack is going to come out with his top five today. I, Ryan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, they might be in it. They might not. I, I, but I think it's the fact that I'm 
kind of lukewarm on whether they'll even be in it is kind of tells you maybe where that where that's going. Right. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if Penn State's in it, but I, I don't know that Penn State's truly in it, if that makes sense. So I, I kind of feel like that's trending Notre Dame. I haven't spoken with them since Alabama and uh, it's no Nick Saban, but it's still Alabama. So I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Michigan, Ohio State, they're also in the mix Wisconsin as well. But, um, you know, it just feels like one of those recruitments where uh, they'll they'll be in there. But I just I never have gotten the impression that either side is truly 100 percent in uh, Sean. We were talking. You, you yeah, I think you hear that. the name and you think that that's that kid's supposed to be associated with Penn State. And, you, and it, it works both ways, I think. Um, and it's just it's been tough because he he came to campus for this junior day, but he hadn't been on campus for was it over a year. Um, so like I, I, I just I, I think people want this more than it's happening you know what i mean more like people it, want this to happen doesn't more than feel like actually... a fit as much as it seems like it should be a fit yeah 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 i think so i, I think throughout the fall and i think that goes both ways too yeah yeah throughout the fall whenever i'd ask it was yeah of course you know saka yeah we we're, we're very interested all that but like in december then i go to his state championship game do we have a good talk after and the biggest thing i took away from that talk was the fact that he really wasn't talking to manny diaz nearly as much as so many other top prospects were talking to their position coach. And that was kind of the first clue of like, eh, I'm not sure how much Penn state's really pushing all out here. And then also the fact that, you know, Anthony goes an entire year without visiting, how interested is he as well? So we'll see. Uh, I don't, I don't know when his list comes out. I, I again, maybe Penn State's going to be on the list, but I don't, I don't, I think this is Notre Dame's recruitment to lose. Maybe Alabama. I don't. I haven't talked to him since then. But you don't it have feels like Notre fuzzies. Dame. Is what is what you're saying? No, no, not really. And uh, hey, they just added Tash. They added Burnett. Like all these other things too. Um, kind of shows you what's going on. I mean, I think we haven't mentioned Ty Jackson much on this podcast, but he's a, a linebacker out of Florida who I think Penn State really likes, and they're going to keep pushing hard. I. He hasn't spoken with anybody, really done any interviews. So it's hard to know where he's at. But I know Penn State really likes him. So keep an eye on him. Elijah Melendez, too. He's committed to Miami, but, you know, just visited not that long ago. There's other guys out there for sure. Um, but, you know, they have three players already who can absolutely yeah. play linebacker. But there's there's room for more, I think, is kind of the conversation, too, Ryan, right? Where you're, you yeah. can still find room. The thing that I find interesting is, is you mentioned this and we've kind of had this conversation is that a lot of these guys have similar build, size, frame, et cetera. We would expect most, of, you know, especially Tash and Burnett, if they play linebacker, I kind of look at both. Personally, I look at both of them as Mike. So, you know, do you have that athlete to be the next will? Um, I know DJ McClary highly rated, but usually Penn State skews more towards those guys than the box Mike guy. So there's room for another. They're still looking for another guy, I think, with plus, plus athleticism. Is that is that mm -hmm. fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, they would absolutely take a Ty Jackson or Elijah Melendez tomorrow. Who I, I think I don't know. I don't know a ton about Ty. I need to learn more, but I, I get the impression those guys kind of fit that mold. Well, let's get into the last thing we're going to talk about today. If you got any comments, any thoughts here in the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel chat, like here on the live show, you can drop those in here. If you got any comments that you want to uh, throw in uh, on the replay, always open to have uh, conversations there as well. Um, just make sure you don't put them in all caps because <laughs> when that happens, I don't know how to respond. Like, I don't, tone is hard to read on the internet anyway. Just, if you're going to make comments or criticisms, do it in a reasonable way with punctuation. That's all. Let's get to the class of 2025. Let's talk about this group because I think it's super interesting the way it's built to start. So I'll be throwing up some facts here on the screen. We'll talk about them as we go. But I want to get into your thoughts and feelings about this group of football players. Uh, is Penn State in the same general place as it has been in terms of number of commitments at this point in the cycle fits. T Frank, I can't believe you, you just told the internet not to do something. And of course we've got a comment already in all caps. So <laughs> good work. That's a good lesson for you. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are with that. I, I'm sorry. I would, can you repeat the question? How are they doing from a number standpoint, from a health of the program? They typically get X number by February. Ryan said two to three during junior days. How, how is the, I guess the, the pace of this class going? Yeah, I think it's a little bit ahead of schedule. Like you, they've got 10 guys so far. So, you know, if we do the math here, that's 40% of your class. And 
I don't see numbers being as big of a deal as they used to be. You know, we used to talk about, you know, they're going to only have room for 16 guys here. They're going to have a big year and have 27 guys. I think you go right around 25 and just go with it nowadays because that's how the math works out. Um, I just, we're not math guys here, but uh, that's kind of how this, uh, this thing works out. But uh, got a couple of linebackers, a couple of running backs. Um, or I guess you can call them three linebackers now, a couple of running backs, a couple of offensive linemen, as I mentioned earlier, that just is a mind block for me that I got to continue to, uh, pay attention to Brady O'Hara. So you look at where the, the holes are right now. And of course, receiver, still a big, big um, talking point throughout this entire cycle. The defensive line um, is one that we're going to be talking about probably more um, probably more in spring and summer. Deion Barnes is going to get on the road and then maybe bring some guys in for camp and see which direction that goes. A guy like Trent Wilson, I think, is a big, uh, a big piece here for Penn State. You've got a quarterback. You're looking to get another quarterback. And then, uh, of course, fill out that secondary. So I think you're a little bit ahead of a schedule in terms of the uh, the number of guys that they've brought in, but uh, it's it's pretty well spread out, with the exception I would say of running back. Yeah, Ryan. they're definitely ahead of schedule. Uh, I mean, last year at this point they had two guys. It was Cooper and Specka, and then Kari Jackson committed at the end of February, and then of course they they had a big run in April last year. I think they had uh, I don't know six seven guys. I mean, they had a bunch of guys in April last year. But even if you look at the two years before that, I think it was six in twenty twenty three, seven in twenty twenty two. So they're certainly uh, uh, exceeding that pace right now. They have the biggest class in the Big Ten at the moment. Ohio State's next with eight. Um, so yeah, they're 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 on a really good pace right now. And by the way, you mentioned Brady O'Hara, Sean. I was doing was doing a little research the other day. He's up to two fifty five now, so he's added fifteen pounds since he's committed. So I think that that speaks to where he's trending. Yeah, and and half of these guys are from Pennsylvania, so you're going to see those guys maybe jump on board, and then they're not. I, I, you know, no disrespect to these guys, but they're not the top of the top in terms of Pennsylvania. So you know, mm -hmm. I think they're guys that makes sense for early commitments there yeah and that's going to be my next question um about this particular class the average star ranking penn state is higher than this 13th overall but the average star ranking right now is 88.21 that is 16th um so still good for this cycle in terms of being a borderline top 15 but maybe not necessarily having a lot of on 300 guys right now in the on three specific rankings, Omari Gaines and DJ McClary, the only two players in the on 300. So um, is how many of this group do you think can get there? And how much of this is, as you said, guys that make sense, things that we want to get into this class, but maybe they're still pursuing guys that will take this group to another level. How much of this is what they normally do, which is identify talent early and then the recruiting rankings catch up and how much is, these guys are, you know, solid football players that they want to add for specific reasons. Uh, what, what do you think, Fitz? Uh, you know, I think we, we get caught in the moment sometimes. It's February. Like, you look at the rankings right now, and it's very early. Um, so mm -hmm. eight of ten guys right now, if you look across the uh, the four networks, eight of ten have a four-star rating from someone. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying it's right. not saying it's wrong. But, like, there are, there are varying degrees of opinions out there on this class right now. And, you know, I like Xavier Thomas. He's not rated by anybody right now. Olin Alassine, I think he's got the athleticism at six, seven and a half to maybe be a guy that moves up. So wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised if there's some guys from the bottom that bubble up and some guys at the top that, you know, sort of uh, linger and, 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 and fall a little bit. So I don't think we're going to fall for February rankings here. Um, yeah. It's just uh, it's one of those things. I think we see some movement going on. Um, we've already seen a little bit of movement, but I think more of that's going to come in the spring and the summer. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Um, I feel like right now the most underrated guy in the class is Tyke Hayes, at least when you look at on threes rating. I, I think he has the potential to be a, a low four-star player. I thought he had a really good junior season. Uh, right, I mean, he's an 89 right now by on three, right? So he's right on the bubble there. I mean, if I had to look over this class and look at somebody who deserves maybe a four-star bump, I'd lean his way. Now, is he an on 300 guy? That's a little bit of a different story. I don't, I'm not so sure about that quite yet, but he would be like, I, I think Tyke Hayes, I would have Tyke Hayes over like, um, well, no, I like Barker Tash. Yeah. I would have him over probably Deshaun Burnett just because of, you know, I, I feel more comfortable knowing mm -hmm. Tyke long term of what he will be, where Burnett, there's just a lot of versatility there or, you know, uh, ambiguity. Uh, what's the right word? I don't know. But it could go a bunch of different ways with Burnett. So I just feel like it's a yeah. safer projection. Not that Burnett could absolutely exceed everything uh, his projections are saying right now. But um, Hayes is just the one guy that just watching him play in the state championship, talking to people after that about his season. Like 
they they people seem to be pretty high on on what they saw from him this year. He's a really good football player, just from a basic standpoint. I think we all agree he's he's awesome at football. Mm -hmm. One thing that I find interesting about this group is there's a lot more, I want to say wild cards, but guys we know less about, at least from, from my standpoint, I know less about Keandre Barker, you know, didn't get a chance to play a whole lot of football last year because of transfer issues. Brady O'Hara is going to play tackle at the next level. And then Amari Gaines, I was looking for some film to put on the show and he doesn't have any updated film. So this is also, I, there's, I, to me, there's a cloud of mystery around this class, more so than some of the other ones where we could have said, Cooper Cousins commits early. We say, okay, we love his frame. We think he can develop into something really good. We like the movement skills. But then there's this class, which has so much versatility that there's a lot of ambiguity in, in a certain That's the sense. word I was trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I guess I just talk. answered my own question. <laughs> about Very good at words. Said. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's some guys that I think that are, you know, uh, probably not going to be at that level. I mean, you mentioned Ormari Gaines. Uh, there's a lot to like in terms of his size, in terms of his range, but, like, the tape isn't there. Deshaun Burnett, you could say the same thing about that. Uh, very curious to see where he's going to end up. Keandre Barker, of course, complete wild card. Like, we need to see him play football at some point. So yeah. I'm interested to see. I think he's got the athleticism. I think he's got a lot of the things that you would you would like. And, you know, saving him a year might save him a year on the back end of his career. But that doesn't tell us much about where he's projected right now. So mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see which, uh, which direction some of these guys go. I don't think they're all going to be up. I mean, yeah. even McClary, like, you know, he's a top 100 guy. But there's questions there, too, on, like, kind of how he fits long term and stuff. Like, I think he's going to be a good player. But, uh, you know, is he a Mike? Is he outside? Like, it's just a lot of questions on a lot of these guys. Right. Any last thoughts about the class? Uh, that's that's all that I had. My questions about sort of the I guess the, the last thing I would ask, actually, is, is this intentional um, in terms of college football has never been more uncertain? NIL is more and more prevalent. Are these guys that you feel like Penn State is taking because they want to have quality players in their class that they feel like are solid? Um, or is this just, as we've talked about before, this is when the bandwidth of normal and these things are just falling this way. Um, and, and coincidence might lead to some of those conversations. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think you look back, I think that the 2023 class was one that had some guys on board early. Like, and that's, I think it just depends on, on the cycle and how guys are, you know, reacting to the previous season, the visits they've taken and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you take a guy like, you know, Xavier Thomas was, was not on the radar and then all of a sudden he's in Penn state's class. And I think that's intentional. You know, like that is a situation where they, they found a guy that they thought really, they really liked and they thought it could boost this class. They also found a guy that they thought profiled similar to what they've used in the past in a guy like Daquan Hardy and had some success with it. So you kind of figure out what type of player works. And I know it's different with Manny. It's different with with Tom Allen. But at the same time, like it's uh, it, it's one of those things where you've you've seen it work in person and you think that this guy can be a similar player. Ryan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I pretty much agree. Um yeah, let me I ask agree. you this one. <laughs> let me ask that. you this one because I think Bain Train uh, has a a point here that I think is also important that we talk about. He asks, "When do the big fish typically commit during a cycle? Would it be almost better to have a class that commits late rather than early, so there's less chance of a flip?" But the part at the beginning yeah. I think is also important that top players want to take official visits. You know, you might get a guy yeah. like Quentin Martin who who committed before his official visit, but um, a lot of times we're talking, we're having these conversations about some of these players in June and July, right? I mean, I, I, I right now, one, two, three, four, five, six of the top 10 players are already committed in the 2025 class. So it's just, I don't think there's a real answer to that. It, it, it all depends on the kid and the relationships. You know, there's a lot of top guys who, uh, you know, they're circled early on and they're able to take all these visits as sophomores and they can make a move early. And then there's going to be others who, you know, are certainly top players and then who emerge later on. And, uh, you know, their recruitments, uh, you know, just last into June. But I, a lot of players, yeah, they want to take official visits and all that. But I, I, the numbers right now in this class kind of say something different. Uh, again, well, one, two, three. I mean, I think, what is it? Well over half of the top 25, I think, are pretty much committed already. And I'm sure if I just kept going down those numbers, it would probably be maybe not half, but 20, 30 percent of them. 
I'm going to say I'm going to say the bulk of the class is, is is still filling out in June and July, like after those official visits. And, you know, what, what we got three or four guys the first weekend of June. And then, you know, it sort of seemed like every weekend after that, you know, you, you catch a couple of stragglers and then you get to the end of that cycle. And all of a sudden you feel, you know, pretty decent about some guys in, in July. So I think June and July is still I, I, I think it's it everything's case by case, obviously. Mm hmm. But in the big picture, I think that's when Penn State's had its most success, and that's when it's got probably some of its best players. And to say, kind of nutshell that, it's early in the recruiting cycle, as Fitz yeah, has been reminding us early. through January and February. Thank you for repeating that. It is early. 31 in the of the top 100. I just did the math. There you go. It, which is, yeah, that's about, that's probably about right on, on, uh, if you, if you go over the averages, but uh, I mean, for Penn state, without a doubt, I mean, summers, how many years have they had massive runs in, in June and July? I mean, that, that's especially over where it works for July, which is always fun. There's no yeah. problem with that whatsoever, guys. It's the best. Yeah. Keep doing that. Uh, <laughs> any final thoughts, Ryan, what are you working on this week at blue white illustrated.com? What's got your mind uh, that you can tell fans about? They can check out over at the site. Well, I want to answer uh, Jar Jar Fett's question about Hun School. I mean, they're certainly interested in Archie. Uh, where he fits long term, we'll see. Like, like I, he's another guy that, I, like, yeah, he's being recruited as a linebacker, but man, his like his running back offensive film is really good too. I mean, there's no doubt that he's a great athlete. He's barely six foot, um, so I think that's kind of giving schools something to think about as far as how he projects long term. But like, yeah, Kamar Archie's a heck of a player with. with with Breeler, I feel like he's going to Oklahoma, or he, I don't think he's going to Penn State. At least I'd have to I'd have to research the other two on there. But um, but Archie is a great athlete. I just don't I don't, I don't know. It doesn't feel like Penn State, I and mean, especially with two and a half linebackers basically committed now, uh, it doesn't feel like they're going all out uh, for him as a linebacker. But he's a heck of an athlete, no doubt. Uh, I'm not going to put you in a position to try and. Uh pronounce a name live on air so thank you uh, fits any th any last words any last thoughts what you working on this week at blue illustrated.com no not much um just uh working on winter workouts uh team stuff uh for the most part i know those guys are back into it and the uh you know the uh daily awards from the coaches are great but we're trying to take that a, a, another level um released a piece yesterday i'm going to supplement that tomorrow with the defensive piece so uh check that out on blue illustrated.com of course uh Continue to gear up for uh, early March because uh, the the dead period will be, will end on March fourth. Penn State's on spring break at that point, um, so they'll start getting guys back onto campus that uh, second full week of March um, when they come back from spring break. I hope you guys enjoy your seventy two hours off. <laughs> I'm off all next week, baby. I got way more than seventy two hours. Oh, that's the answer to your question. What am I working on next week? Nothing. Yeah. Can't wait. Sorry, Sean. All right. We will be back with more Penn State football <laughs> talk, uh, Penn State wrestling. Our wrestling show comes tomorrow at 10 a.m. here in the BWI Live Spot. It's kind of a big deal uh, out in Iowa for a top five showdown with the Hawkeyes and, of course, the BJC duel coming up on Monday. Greg Pickle covers all of that coming up tomorrow. And the Hoop Show, you can check that out here or at bluewhiteillustrated.com. All kinds of great stuff that we got you covered for uh, this weekend and beyond. I'm Thomas Frank Carr for Sean Fitz and Ryan Snyder. We will talk to you later.